Hey guys, in this tutorial we're going to be adding some basic 2D animation to our little character sprite here. You'll be able to punch and kick and all that stuff. Uh, unfortunately, in this tutorial we're going to be just kind of hard coding it for a specific uh, sprite sheet and a specific set of animations. Uh, however, if you wanted to, uh, what you could do is later as, as an exercise is you could actually make it to where you can define the animations in an external file like an any file or a YAML file or a Lua file or, or something uh, that will allow the artists to actually uh, change the number of frames of each animation, which frames are used, and all that without actually having to compile your code. Because right now we're going to be defining uh, everything in code pretty much, other than the texture itself, uh, which isn't the best practice, but it's enough to get you guys understanding how this 2D animation works and how easy it is uh, and, and how to use it in your own games. Now the first thing we need to do before we actually start doing any animation code is we need to fix our sprite sheet. Uh, this is the sprite sheet that I provided you, the one we got from Open Game Art. Uh, unfortunately, the first six sprites are kind of out of order, and they also have some uh, little black pixels in there for no apparent reason. So what I went ahead and did is fixed uh, this. I put those six sprites in the correct order, so if you want to do it yourself, those first six sprites should look like this. We'll zoom in for you. Uh, and they should also not have the little black pixels, because we don't want that. Otherwise, if you don't do this, your running animation will look really weird because the sprites are not ordered correctly. Now, after you've done that, after you've fixed that, or just downloaded my fixed version from the GitHub uh, link in the description, uh, we can go ahead and start working on uh, coding up our little uh, 2D animation, which is actually going to be really simple. Now, what we want to be able to do is uh, actually stop hard coding our UV coordinates right here. I'm in player.draw right now. We're just hard coding it to use that standing... Uh, animation, just the, the single frame from that, and we've got hard-coded the UV coordinates, and this is really hard to read and understand. Uh, so what we should be doing is instead uh, giving ourselves a way to just look up a specific tile and use it. So what we can do is we can say this bottom, uh, we'll say the bottom left-hand tile right here, this will be zero, this is index zero, and then as we go to the right, we just keep adding one. Uh, this one all the way over here is going to be number nine, since it's uh, a t two by ten or ten by two 10 by 2, yeah, um, sprite sheet. This top one here is going to be 10, and then all the way over here we'll have 19. So we should be able to just provide an index, and then it'll use that specific tile. And that'll make it really easy for us to do our animations. For instance, we can say these first six tiles here are the run animations. So tiles 10 through 15, those are going to be all of the actual uh, running animation sprites, and if we can specify that, then we can easily just cycle through these to actually play our run animation. So don't save that. Uh, what we want to do to make this process really easy is we want to create ourselves another class, uh, and we'll go ahead and put this in, we'll put it in Bingen. We're going to say add, and really we don't even need a uh, to, to add class, we can just do add uh, item, and we can just add a header file, because it's going to be a really basic file, pretty much just one method, or two methods, I guess. And let's go ahead and call this tile sheet. And, uh, yeah, tile sheet. So a tile sheet is going to be a class for basically what we have. is just a sprite sheet where all of the uh, sprites are the exact same size, just a grid of sprites. So let's go ahead and call it class tile sheet. And we'll say public and private. And then at the top, we're going to do uh, pragma once, like we usually do. Now, really, we can make the whole thing public. It's going to be really basic. It's just going to have a couple members. And I don't feel bad making everything public for this. We'll have an init function. We'll say void init. And this will take a uh, GL, what is it, uh, GL texture. And we have to include GL texture for that. And this will be texture. And let's go ahead and say const GL texture texture, just because it's a nice thing to do. And let's go ahead and give it a int uh, x tiles and y tiles, or we can just pass in a GLM i vec 3, uh, and we'll call it tile dims. So this will be the x and y dimensions of our tile sheet in tiles. So for the one that we uh, provided uh, for the for the actual blue ninja one, it's going to be a 10 by 2 since there's 10 x tiles in the x direction and two y tiles. So private, we're not going to have anything. Uh, let's go ahead and add some member variables. We're going to have a gl texture texture, and we're also going to have a glm ivec3 dims like that. And what we can do is we can access these public variables really easily. And we're also going to have another method here. We'll say glm 
uh, vec4 get uvs for a specific index. And we're going to pass in a specific index for that. So when we pass in a tile index, it's going to return for us a glm vec4, which is the uv coordinates for that tile, to make things really easy. And we'll just initialize it with a texture and pass in some tile dimensions. Now we're getting a little uh, bit of error messaging here because, first of all, this is supposed to be a namespace benjin. So we'll say namespace benjin, capital B, I believe. And we also need to include glm because we don't have that. Include, I believe it's glm, glm.hpp. There we go. And that should get rid of all these errors. There we go. So now we have a tile sheet, and we can use this instead of a GL texture by itself in our player. So let's go to player.h, and instead of benjin GL texture m texture, we're going to include sprite, or sorry, tile sheet. It's going to be benjin tile sheet m texture. That's fine. We can keep it as m texture. Now when we initialize the player, we'll say benjin texture or GL texture texture equals that and at the bottom here we'll initialize the actual uh, texture so we're going to say m texture dot init the texture is going to be texture the dimensions are going to be glm ivec3 and it's 10 by 2 and do we need to include glm here what's it saying here ivec2 not ivec3 I'm so used to 3d this should be ivec2 dims as well now, since we only have a header file, and since we just have these two little functions, we can actually do the implementation in the header file. We're just going to say this arrow texture equals texture, and the reason I'm using this is because we have a name conflict. They're both called texture. And for completeness, I'll just go ahead and do that for dims too, even though we don't have a name conflict. This dims equals tile dims, and for get UVs, now this is the one that's a little bit more complicated. Let me open back up our uh, little sprite thing. I'll just open it in paint. Now, for this, we want to just be able to pass in an index and get out the UV coordinates, uh, so we need to determine what X and Y uh, row and column we are on with that particular index. And to do that, we just need to use a little bit of math. It's actually really, really easy stuff, just taking into account the dimensions that we actually passed in. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to first get the X tile and then the Y tile, and we're going to use that to get the UV coordinates. So the way we get the X tile is we're just going to say int X tile, equals index, and we're just going to say index modulo the dims.x. And you're familiar with the modulus operator. All that's going to do is it's going to make sure that as soon as we overflow 10 tiles, it uh, clamps back down to zero, because we're doing the remainder of a division by 10. So if we put a 10, uh, which is, if, if we type in a 10, we definitely want this one right here, since that's the 10th index. If we do 10 modulo 10, that's going to be 0. And indeed, we do have x coordinate 0 up here at the top left. Now for the y tile, it's similar, except instead of the modulus operation, we're going to do the division operation. And we still do it by dimensions.x. And this is an integer division. We have index is an integer and dims.x is an integer, so it's not going to have any floating point remainder. And this will give us the y tile. Now that we have that, we can actually calculate the position on our UV rect, and we can also uh, calculate the dimensions of the UV rect, and we don't even need this for the dimensions. The dimensions is really easy. So first let's create our return value, vec4 UVs. We're going to say uv.x equals, and it's going to be x tile divided by float dims.x. Now the reason I'm putting a float there is, of course, because we don't want an integer division in this case. We want to get the actual floating point division and return uh, the remainder as part of that variable. That should be uvs.x. And for uvs.y, we do uvs.y equals, and it's going to be y tile divided by float dims.y. For the width and height, these are really easy. uvs.z, this is the x uh, width, is going to be 1.0f divided by uh, dims.x. So do another floating point division. We just want one tile out of 10 tiles. And for uvs.w, which is the uh, y dimension, we're going to say 1.0f divided by dims.y. Dims.y. And that's all there is to it. And then finally, we just return uvs. And there we go. Now we have our tile sheet that we can use uh, to get the uv coordinates for a specific tile. Let's go ahead and test it and make sure it works. If we go to player.cpp, 
instead of using a hard-coded uh, set of UVs right here, what we can do is we can say mTexture dot get UVs. We're going to put the index of zero because that's the index of our little standing sprite here at the bottom left. And here, instead of mTexture.id, it's got to be mTexture.Texture.id. And there we go. Now we can run it, and we should have a standing sprite just like we did before. And there we go. Our sprite is indeed standing still. Let's go ahead and get rid of all of the bounding boxes. We don't need that right now for debugging, and let's also make it so there's a lot fewer of the actual uh, boxes that are falling. So in the, let's see, on entry, where we have num boxes, let's do 10 instead of 100. And then in the gameplay screen, let's go ahead and set render debug to false. This is in the header file. There we go. And now let's actually do some animation. So we're going to go back into player.cpp. And what we need to do is we need to basically just determine what the player's state is. Is he moving left? Is he moving right? Is he jumping? Is he... Uh, is crouching, well we don't have a crouch animation, is he punching, is he kicking, whatever, and we're going to play a specific animation from that. Now what we need for that is we need to be able to first determine if he's on the ground. The first thing we should probably do is the jumping animation because I think that's going to be the easiest one. And if I zoom in here, the jumping animation is this one over at the, the right side, and I don't even have a scroll bar for, on Microsoft Paint for some reason. This one right here, I'm going to box it in red. This right here, this one on the left, this is jumping up, and the one on the right is kind of falling. So once you're on the down part of the jump, we play this animation. Uh, it's not even animation, it's just a single frame. But this will be a good start to our actual animation stuff. Uh, now what we want to do is keep track of when he's actually touching the ground and when he's in the air. So let's go ahead and add a boolean to player.h. We're going to say bool m, and we'll call it m on ground. And let's set that to false to start out with. And now when we update, what we can do is, before we check collision, we'll always set on ground equals false. And then when we actually do the collision, uh, where we check for if he can jump, instead of using this below variable, we're just going to use on ground. Or actually, we'll still use below, but here, if below is true, we can say on ground equals true. Equals true. So... If we are touching the ground, then on ground will be true, but if we never hit any of these, then on ground will be false. And what we can do is in the draw function, we can start figuring out how our animation is going to work. So let's say uh, calculate animation. Now let's go ahead and check if he's on the ground and then apply a different effect based on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if, on, uh, if m on ground and then else. So this is going to be in the air. Now if he's on the ground, we can just do our normal standing still animation for now. We're not going to have punching or moving yet. So what we need to do is we need to keep track of what the index is going to be. So let's go ahead and add an integer up here at the top. We'll say int tile index. And let's also add the number of tiles in the specific animation we want to play. So we're going to say int num tiles. And let's also add, uh, for future reference, we're not going to really use it yet, let's add a float animation speed, and we'll set that to, I think 0.2 probably would work okay for now. Now, if we're on the ground, we want to play the animation at tile index 0, so we're just going to say 0 for tile index, and the number of tiles in the animation is 1. It's just a static animation that doesn't do anything. So num tiles is 1 and tile index equals zero. However, if we're in the air, we want to use a different one. If we're in the air, uh, we're going to be playing, if we're going up, we're going to be playing this animation, and if we're going down, we're going to be playing this animation. So it really depends on our velocity. Luckily, we have our physics body, so we can actually get uh, the velocity from those. So let's go ahead and just do a if statement uh, for linear velocity in the y direction and see what that gives us uh, for the animations. Let's go ahead and say if uh, body get linear velocity dot x or sorry dot y is less than or equal to zero then we'll say we're falling else we'll say we're rising. So this is falling and this is rising. And really, 
Uh, we're probably going to be looking at velocity a lot, so to make this a little bit easier, let's just store the velocity. GLM vec2 velocity, and we're going to say velocity.x equals get linear velocity.x, and velocity.y equals get linear velocity.y. That way we're not typing out this body get linear velocity all the time. And now we can say velocity.y. Alright, so if we are falling, then the number of tiles is again going to be 1. In fact, for both of these it's going to be 1. And let's see, what is the animation index? Well, this one right here is 10. So this one for the rising is going to be uh, 16. And then this one for the falling, or sorry, the rising is going to be 16 and the falling is going to be 17. So let's try that. We're going to say tile index for falling is, what did I say, 16? 17. And the tile index for rising is going to be 16. All right, so let's see what this does. If we're on the ground, we're going to be standing still. If we're rising, we're going to be using this tile index. If we're falling, we're going to be using this tile index. Sorry, I got those backwards. And now, instead of mtextures.getUV0, uh, for now, let's just pass in mtextures.getUV tile index. We're not going to take into account num tiles or the animation speed just yet. Let's see what that looks like. All right, now we are falling. And when I jump, as you can see, he plays the animation. When I'm rising, because of that velocity, since it's up, we're going to be playing the jumping animation, or the rising animation, whatever you want to call it. And when we're falling, it's going to be playing the falling animation. And then, of course, when we land, we get that uh, on-ground boolean to set uh, to true, and then we play the standing animation. Now, when I move left, we should also look left. So let's do that as well. Let's figure out how to do direction. So let's add a direction variable. We'll say, uh, we'll put it in the header file. Let's say int m direction. We'll go and start that out at 1. Now, direction can be either 1 or negative 1. Now, you could use a Boolean for this, but I like to use 1 or negative 1. Now, in the update loop, what we can do is we can look if he's trying to move left or trying to move right, and we can set the direction accordingly. So if A is pressed, we want to move left, so we're going to say direction equals negative 1. This is just going to be the direction in the x-axis. And, of course, for D, that's going to be the opposite. We're going to be going to the right. M direction equals 1. Now, when direction equals 1, we're already facing the right way, so we don't have to do anything. However, when direction equals negative 1, we've got to change something here. And what we've got to do is we've got to actually flip the UV coordinates. And it's actually going to be really simple to do. What we do is we need to actually store the UV rect. So let's say UV, uh, let's say GLM vec4 UV rect equals this right here. And then we'll pass it in. So now we can make a few modifications to it after we actually get those UVs. All we have to do is say UV rect dot x plus equals 1.0f divided by m texture. Uh, dot dims dot x. Now what this is going to do is it's going to add one tile. So let's say we are at the standing animation at the bottom left. Right now we're grabbing this tile. What it's going to do is it's going to push it to the right and we're going to be grabbing this tile. However, next thing we're going to do is we're going to reverse the direction of the uh, x for the v coordinate or the u coordinate. So we're going to say uv rect dot z this is the uh, width of that UV. We're going to say times equals negative 1. So now in the shader, it's going to be a negative number for the uh, dimensions of that X. And that's actually going to cause us to, instead of grabbing this tile, it's going to cause us to grab this tile again, but backwards. And I'll show you how that works. Let's go ahead and run it. When I'm walking right, it looks right. When I walk left, it looks left. It's as easy as that. Very, very simple to do. And it all plays in really well with our existing sprite batch. All right, we've got a little bit more work to do. Let's do check direction. And this will be get the UV coordinates from the tile index. And finally, draw the sprite. Comments are always good, even if they're pretty obvious. And all right, so now what we need to do is we need to do running, and then we'll do punching after we do running. So let's start with just running on the ground. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be checking the velocity and seeing if our velocity is big enough to where we want to start playing an animation. And if it is, we can actually speed up our animation based on how fast we're going.
So let's do an if statement here. I'm going to say if, and let's use the absolute value of the velocity, because we don't care what the direction is for the velocity. We're going to say if the absolute value of velocity dot x, and let's just say is greater than 1.0f, then we'll start playing it. And uh, now what we need to do is we need to check if, uh, actually let's just go with this for now. I think that's good enough for now. We can make some additions. And then we'll do an else. And the else will be play the standing animation. So this is standing. And this will be running. Now for this, let's see, what is the tile? Uh, the tile index is 10, and the number of tiles are 6. So we're going to say num tiles equals 6, and tile index equals 10. And that's good enough for now. We'll be changing some things for sure, because uh, it's not going to look too great right now. Now what we need to do is actually do the uh, animation calculation now. And we need to do this uh, by changing the actual animation uh, over time. And what we need to do for that is we need to actually store an animation time variable in our player. So let's go ahead and do a float anim time. We'll start that out at zero. Oops. And then in the CPP file, we're going to take advantage of this. Now what we can do is increment animation time. So we can say anim time plus equals anim speed. Now, we're not passing in a delta time. Uh, if you remember the time step episode, we actually pass around delta time based on the frame rate. That would probably make this better, but right now I'm not using it. You guys know how to do that. So we can increment the animation time, and now what we need to do is change our tile index based on the animation time and the number of tiles. And this is actually really easy. So apply animation. We're going to say tile index equals tile index plus and we're going to first cast animation time to an integer. We're going to say int anim time. And then we're going to divide it by the number, or sorry, we're going to uh, take the modulus of the number of tiles, so num tiles. So if num tiles is 1, this is going to be an animation time variable modulo 1, which is always going to be 0. So tile index is always tile index, nothing changes. But if we have number tiles uh, set to 6, then this is going to cycle through those 6 tiles. So let's see what that looks like. Let's run it. All right, and when I land, if I start walking, it will play the running animation. And that's pretty neat. Now, it could be better. Uh, for instance, it's, it doesn't look like it's starting or stopping at the right time. It doesn't take into account how fast I'm going. If I kind of decelerate and then accelerate again, it's always playing the animation at the same speed. So first, let's handle, handle the acceleration. Another thing that's actually really easy to do, all this stuff is very, very easy. What we need to do is we need to just keep into account the x velocity or the absolute value of that x velocity. And what I'm going to do is in the running, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say animation speed equals the absolute value of velocity dot x times some factor. So let's do times 0 0.1. That's probably going to be way too much, but let's see. Now when I run it, it's going to take into account velocity. And yeah, those legs are going way too fast. Let's try 0 0.025. Let's see what that looks like. And that, I think, is much better. That looks good. So when we slow down, his legs slow down. And when we speed up, his legs speed up. Something that's very easy to do, but gives a really, really pleasing effect. It's really great. All right, now we have jumping, we have running. We still need kicking. And I think that when he slows down, or when you let go of the key, I think he should just kind of stand still and sort of just uh, slide, maybe. Because uh, I don't really like the fact that his legs just kind of slow down and then he pops into that animation. Let's just mess around with that a little bit more. Uh, first, what we want to do is, uh, really what we should be doing is starting all of our animations at the first frame. Right now, we have this m anim time variable that just keeps incrementing forever and ever and ever, but each time we switch animations, it should reset to zero so that we are in ensuring that we are starting the animation at the first frame. And to do that, we're going to need to keep track of a state. So let's go ahead and add another variable to our, or a set of variables to our header file. This is going to be an enum class and we'll call this move state. We'll call it player move state. And let's do standing, and we'll do running, 
We'll do punching and uh, in air. We're not going to differentiate between rising and falling. Uh, standing, running, punching, in air. That seems good for now. And we'll go ahead and store that. We'll do a player move state. And we'll call it M move state. And we'll start this out as uh, player move state punching. Punching. No, not punching. What am I saying? Standing. Now in the CPP file, we can use our move state to make sure we're going to start all of these at the same time. What we can do is, let's say we're in the running loop up here. We can say if m move state is not equal to player move state running, then we can say move state equals the running move state, and then we can reset our timer, our little accumulator. And we can say m anim time equals zero. And that will make sure that anytime we start running, uh, when we weren't running before, it always starts the run animation at the same time. Now we don't do have to do anything like that for standing still. That's really, really simple. Uh, but uh, for the air stuff, uh, let's see, we also don't have to do anything for the air stuff. But let's go ahead and also use uh, the move state for those as well. We'll say uh, m move state oops, equals player move state in air, just in case we want to get this information later. It's good to be complete. In air, and then when we're standing still, we'll say m move state equals player move state standing. If we don't do this, even though we're not using them for anything else, if we don't do this, it won't reset the running animation because the uh, move state will always be set to player move state running. And now let's see if that looks any different. It should look about the same. And there we go. It looks pretty good. Now when I actually turn around, I don't want my legs to keep going in that same direction. I want to kind of stop and then slide and then start running back in the other direction. So I've got an idea to do that. Let's see if it works. Let's go into uh, this calculation right here. Uh, we're checking if the absolute value of the velocity is greater than zero. Let's add another condition. And, and then in parentheses, we're going to have uh, two uh, statements, and we're going to or them together. The first will be, is the velocity uh, dot x is greater than zero and the direction is greater than zero. So if he's uh, applying velocity in the direction he's going. And of course the opposite case, if velocity is less than zero and direction is less than zero. So we'll say less than zero, direction is less than zero. So both of those have to be true and his velocity has to be greater than one, uh, the absolute value of it. Now let's run that and see what it looks like. There we go. Now when he stops and starts going in the other direction, his feet kind of stand still and he slides for a second. And personally, I think that looks a little better, but you can do it however you want, of course. You can make any kind of modifications that you desire. And of course, you could also use a different animation altogether. I'm sure you could find better animations than these. Okay, we have running, uh, we have jumping, and actually, I think I want to modify the jumping as well. Uh, when I actually jump in the air, I want to, uh, if I'm going really fast in a certain direction, I want him to kind of lean forward like he is in the run animation. If I look here, this first uh, sprite right here looks like a good, uh, a good sprite for that, for when he's kind of jumping in a certain direction. So let's try using that. Let's see. And for that, we're going to be checking when we're in the air. And what we need to do is just check our velocity. And what we can say is maybe if the velocity in the x direction is greater than like 10 or something like that. Let's try that. If, uh, we'll say absolute value of velocity dot x is greater than 10. What am I doing? Then we're going to uh, play that first animation. And it's the same uh, tile that starts the running animation. So it's at tile index 10 and the number of tiles for this one is going to be 1. So num tiles equals 1, tile index equals 10. And we'll say else if here. And of course, we need to say we're in air. I know you're thinking all of these have in air, so why not just take it out? Well, there's going to be one more state for kicking that it's not going to have the in air state. It's going to be like the punching state or something. Now, let's see how this looks. I believe this will look pretty good. Uh, there we go. When I am running really fast in one direction and I jump, he does this little sideways. Jump animation. However, when I go left, it doesn't work. Did I mess up the absolute value? 
Yes, I put the whole thing in absolute value. We don't want to do that. There we go. Now it should work in both directions. Let's run this. There we go. And I think 10, 10 is probably not enough. Let's see. Oh, I didn't do 10. I did 1. That's probably why. Let's try 10. There we go. And if he's not going fast enough, he'll play that uh, normal, just kind of jumping or falling animation. But if he's going really fast, he'll be playing the, uh, the correct animation for going sideways really quickly. Okay, now all we are missing is punching and kicking. Uh, and we're not going to actually make punching or kicking do anything. We're just going to animate them. Uh, and we'll use, I guess, the space bar to do a punch or a kick. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, do bool m punching. Now I'm going to have just one boolean for both of them because what I'm going to do is say if you're in the air that's a kick, if you're on the ground that's a punch and that's just how it's going to work just for simplicity. You can do it however you want. And what we want to do is in the update loop we just want to check the input manager if input manager dot is key pressed sdlk space then we're going to do m punching equals true. There we go check for punch. And we're almost done here. Now let's go ahead and do the on the ground punching first. If m punching and we'll do else if here. Uh, let's do the same thing we normally do. We want to start the animation correctly so if m move state is not equal to punching then we're going to set it to punching and start that animation over. And then we need to actually get the correct uh, tile index. So let's look at our little thing here. And it looks like it starts at index 1 and it's 4 frames long. This last one right here isn't part of the punching frame. This is the getting hit frame. So that's the animation you'll play if you get damaged, which we won't implement right now. Uh, so let's go ahead and say num tiles equals 4, tile index equals 1. And let's also do the kicking animation for if we're in the air and we're punching. So I'm going to just copy paste this down here. And this is why I didn't do move state on the outside. So we're going to say move state is punching even though he's kicking. Now for this one, the tile index is going to be, let's see, this one out here is going to be 18. And the number of tiles is going to be 1. So we'll say tile index equals 18, number of tiles equals 1. And since this punching animation, or kicking animation, is only one frame, whereas this one is four frames, we should play the frame four times slower, at one-fourth the speed. So what we can do in here is we can say uh, anim speed times equals 0 0.25. So that'll make sure it plays slower so that it lasts the same amount of time as the punching animation, even though it's only one frame. Now when I run it, we should have everything we need. So if I press space, he does a little punch. And if I, <laughs> and the punching never ceases, uh, because what we should actually be doing is once the punch completes, we should not be actually punching anymore. And I didn't actually add that if statement. So let's go ahead and do that. And this is something that's going to be really easy as well. All we got to do is check for punch end. And actually, let's do it after we increment the animation time. Check for punch end. And all we're going to do is we're going to say if m animation time is greater than num tiles then we're going to stop the animation so if we've progressed the animation so that it's about to loop back again we stop m is punching equals false there we go and what is it m punching not is punching uh, really is punching makes a lot more sense so I'm going to use visual, visual assist to refactor this to m is punching but you can call it whatever you like. There we go, now it should stop the animation after that plays and it's going to set in punching equal to false even if we're not playing the punching animation at all but that's fine, it's not going to cause any problems. Because if we're not punching we don't care anyways. Now when I press punch, he punches and now I can punch and kind of slide on the ground at the same time so really maybe there should be another animation for attacking while running but we don't have that. I'm sure you guys can make one or find it. If I jump in the air and press space he will kick which does nothing but uh, we could use this uh, in our little game so that we could actually fight bad guys. Maybe we can have an animation for like throwing shriekins and ninja stars, whatever. Whatever you want to do for your ninja game. So thanks for watching. 
Uh, in the next tutorial, I want to cover some basic 2D lighting stuff because people were asking about that. And then I think we'll move on to a little bit of UI and maybe make a simple map editor. And then we should be good to go on the 3D series because I think that's really all I want to talk about in this tutorial series. So thanks for watching, everybody. Hey guys, there's one bug I forgot to tell you about uh, that we introduced in the previous version that uh, we should definitely fix. Uh, when we are doing the actual code to determine if we're standing on the ground, what we're doing is we're just checking to make sure that we're colliding with something pretty much below this point right here, which worked well for when we were using the box collision, but when we switch to capsule collision, if we're standing on a slope, we may actually be standing on a slope like this or something, and then we're actually colliding uh, further up than the, just the very bottom. So what we want to do is check if we're colliding on anything below this point right here. And it's really easy to fix that. All we got to do is go into the actual collision code and the update function. Go down here. This is where we check if uh, below is true, if we are standing on the ground. And all we're going to do is we're just going to do an add uh, m capsule get dimensions dot x uh, divided by 2. Like that. And now we can stand on sloped surfaces uh, and still be able to jump. It'll still count as being on the ground. Let me see if I can find us a little slope surfaces. Here's one. And I, this may have worked before just because this isn't a very big slope. Uh, but now it will definitely be working uh, for even really steep slopes.